Chapter six of The Logic of Hegel by Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, translated by William Wallace. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ryan Smallwood. Chapter six Logic further defined and divided. In point of form, logical doctrine has three sides the abstract side or the understanding, the dialectical or that of negative reason the speculative or that of positive reason these three sides do not make three parts of logic but are stages or moments in every logical entity that is of every notion and truth whatever they may all be put under the first stage that of understanding and so kept isolated from each other but this would give an inadequate conception of them the statement of the dividing lines and the characteristic aspects of logic is at this point no more than historical and anticipatory thought as understanding sticks to fixity of characters and their distinctness from one another every such limited abstract it treats as having a subsistence and being of its own in our ordinary usage of the term thought and even notion we often have before our eyes nothing more than the operation of understanding and no doubt thought is primarily an exercise of understanding only it goes further and the notion is not a function of understanding merely the action of understanding may be in general described as investing its subject matter with the form of universality but this universal is an abstract universal that is to say its opposition to the particular is so rigorously maintained that it is at the same time also reduced to a character of a particular again in this separating and abstracting attitude towards its object understanding is the reverse of immediate perception and sensation which as such keep completely to their native sphere of action in the concrete it is by referring to this opposition of understanding to sensation or feeling that we must explain the frequent attacks made upon thought for being hard and narrow and for leading if consistently developed to ruinous and pernicious results the answer to these charges in so far as they are warranted by their facts is that they do not touch thinking in general certainly not the thinking of reason but only the exercise of understanding it must be added however that their merit and rights of the mere understanding should unhesitatingly be admitted and the merits lie in the fact that apart from understanding there is no fixity or accuracy in the region either of theory or of practice thus in theory knowledge begins by apprehending existing objects in their specific differences in the study of nature for example we distinguish matters forces genera and the like and stereotype each in its isolation thought is here acting in its analytic capacity where its canon is identity a simple reference of each attribute to itself it is under the guidance of the same identity that the process in knowledge is affected from one scientific truth to another thus for example in mathematics magnitude is the feature which to the neglect of any other determines our advance hence in geometry we compare one figure with another so as to bring out their identity similarly in other fields of knowledge such as jurisprudence the advance is primarily regulated by identity in it we argue from one specific law or precedent to another and what is this but to proceed on the principle of identity but understanding is as indispensable in practice as it is in theory character is an essential in conduct and a man of character is an understanding man who in that capacity has definite ends in view and undeviatingly pursues them the man who will do something great must learn as goethe says to limit himself the man who on the contrary would do everything really would do nothing and fails there is a host of interesting things in this world spanish poetry chemistry politics and music are all very interesting and if any one takes an interest in them we need not find fault but for a person in a given situation to accomplish anything he must stick to one definite point and not dissipate his forces in many directions in every calling too the great thing is to pursue it with understanding thus the judge must stick to the law and give his verdict in accordance with it undeterred by one motive or another allowing no excuses and looking neither left nor right understanding too is always an element in thorough training the trained intellect is not satisfied with cloudy and indefinite impressions but grasps the objects in their fixed character whereas the uncultivated man wavers unsettled and it often costs a deal of trouble to come to an understanding with him on the matter under discussion and to bring him to fix his eye on the definite point in question it has been already explained that the logical principle in general far from being merely a subjective action in our minds is rather the very universal which as 
such is also objective this doctrine is illustrated in the case of understanding the first form of logical truths understanding in this larger sense corresponds to what we all call goodness of god so far as that means that finite things are and subsist in nature for example we recognize the goodness of god in the fact that various classes or species of animals and plants are provided with whatever they need for their preservation and welfare nor is man accepted who both as an individual and as a nation possesses partly in the given circumstances of climate of quality and products of soil and partly in his natural parts or talents all that is required for his maintenance and development under this shape understanding is visible in every department of the objective world and no object in that world can ever be wholly perfect which does not give a full satisfaction to the canons of understanding a state for example is imperfect so long as it has not reached a clear differentiation of orders and callings and so long as those functions of politics and government which are different in principle have not evolved for themselves special organs in the same way as we see for example the developed animal organism provided with separate organs for the function of sensation motion digestion etc the previous course of the discussion may serve to show that understanding is indispensable even in those spheres and regions of action which the popular fancy would deem furthest from it and that in proportion as understanding is absent from them imperfection is the result this particularly holds good of art religion and philosophy in art for example understanding is visible where the forms of beauty which differ in principle are kept distinct and exhibited in their purity the same thing holds good also of a single work of art it is part of the beauty and perfection of a dramatic poem that the characters of the several persons should be closely and faithfully maintained and that the different aims and interests involved should be plainly and decidedly exhibited or again take the province of religion the superiority of greek over northern mythology apart from the other differences of subject matter and conception mainly consists in this that in the former the individual gods are fashioned into forms of sculpture like distinctness of outline while in the latter the figures fade away vaguely and hazily into one another lastly comes philosophy that philosophy never can get on without the understanding hardly calls for special remark after what has been said its foremost requirement is that every thought shall be grasped in its full precision and nothing allowed to remain vague and indefinite it is usually added that understanding must not go too far which is so far correct that understanding is not an ultimate but on the contrary finite and so constituted that when carried to extremes it veers round to its opposite it is the fashion of youth to dash about in abstractions but the man who has learnt to know life steers clear of the abstract either or and keeps to the concrete in the dialectical stage these finite characterizations or formulae supersede themselves and pass into their opposites one but when the dialectical principle is employed by the understanding separately and independently especially as seen in its application to philosophical theories dialectic becomes scepticism in which the result that ensues from its action is presented as a mere negation it is customary to treat dialectic as an adventitious art which for the very wantonness introduces confusion and a mere semblance of contradiction into definite notions and in that light the semblance is the nonentity while the true reality is supposed to belong to the original dicta of understanding often indeed dialectic is nothing more than a subjective seesaw of argument pro and con where the absence of sterling thought is disguised by the subtlety which gives birth to such arguments but in its true and proper character dialectic is the very nature and essence of everything predicated by mere understanding the law of things and of the finite as a whole dialectic is different from reflection in the first instance reflection is the movement out beyond the isolated predicate of a thing which gives it some reference and brings out its relativity while still in other respects leaving it in its isolated validity but by dialectic is meant the indwelling tendency outwards by which the one-sidedness and limitation of the predicates of understanding is seen in its true light and shown to be the negation of them for anything to be finite it is just to suppress itself and put itself aside thus understood the dialectical principle constitutes the life and soul of scientific progress the dynamic which alone gives imminent connection and necessity to the body of science and in a word is seen to constitute the real and true as opposed to the external exaltation above the finite it is of the highest importance to ascertain and understand rightly the nature of dialectic wherever there is movement wherever there is life wherever anything is carried into effect in the actual world there dialectic is at work it is also the soul of all knowledge which is truly scientific in the popular way of looking at things the refusal to be bound by the abstract deliverances of understanding appears as fairness which according to the proverb 
live and let live demands that each should have its turn we admit the one but we admit the other also but when we look more closely we find that the limitations of the finite do not merely come from without that its own nature is the cause of its abrogation and that by its own act it passes into its counterpart we say for instance that man is mortal and seem to think that the ground of his death is the external circumstances only so that if this way of looking were correct man would have two special properties vitality and also mortality but the true view of the matter is that life as life involves the germ of death and that the finite being radically self-contradictory involves its own self-suppression nor again is the dialectic to be confused with mere sophistry the essence of sophistry lies in giving authority to partial and abstract principle in its isolation as may suit the interest and particular situation of the individual at the time for example a regard to my existence and my having means of existence is a vital motive of conduct but if i exclusively emphasize this consideration or motive of my welfare and draw the conclusion that i may steal or betray my country we have a case of sophistry similarly it is a vital principle in conduct that i should be subjectively free that is to say that i should have an insight into what i am doing and a conviction that it is right but if my pleading insists on this principle alone i fall into sophistry such as would overthrow all principles of morality but this sort of party pleading dialectic is wholly different its purpose is to study things in their own being and movement thus to demonstrate the finitude of partial categories of understanding dialectic it may be added is no novelty in philosophy among the ancient plato is termed the inventor of dialectic and his right to the name rests on the fact that the platonic philosophy first gave the free scientific and thus at the same time objective form to dialectic socrates as we should expect from the general character of his philosophizing has the dialectical element in a predominantly subjective shape that of irony he used to turn his dialectic first against ordinary consciousness and then especially against the sophists in his conversations he used to simulate the wish for some clearer knowledge about the subject under discussion and after putting all sorts of questions with that intent he drew on those with whom he conversed the opposite of what their first impressions had pronounced correct if for instance the sophists claimed to be teachers socrates by a series of questions forced the sophist protagoras to confess that all learning is only recollection in his more strictly scientific dialogues plato employs the dialectical method to show the finitude of all hard and fast terms of understanding thus in the parmenides he deduces the many from the one and shows nevertheless that the many cannot but define itself as the one in this grand style did plato treat dialectic in modern times it was more than any other kant who resuscitated the name of dialectic and restored it to its post of honour he did it as we have seen by working on the antinomies of reason the problem of these antinomies is no more subjective piece of work oscillating between one set of grounds and another it really serves to show that every abstract proposition of understanding taken precisely as it is given naturally veers round into its opposite however reluctant understanding may be to admit the action of dialectic we must not suppose that the recognition of its existence is peculiarly confined to the philosopher it would be truer to say that dialectic gives expression to a law which is felt in other grades of consciousness and in general experience everything that surrounds us may be viewed as an instance of dialectic we are aware that everything finite instead of being stable and ultimate is rather changeable and transient and this is exactly what we mean by the dialectic of the finite by which the finite as implicitly other than what it is is forced beyond its own immediate or natural being to turn suddenly into its opposite we have before this identified understanding with what is implied in the popular idea of the goodness of god we may now remark of the dialectic in the same objective signification that its principle answers to the idea of his power all things we say that is the finite world as such are doomed and in saying so we have a vision of dialectic as the universal and irresistible power before which nothing can stay however secure and stable it may deem itself the category of power does not it is true exhaust the depth of the divine nature or the notion of god but it certainly forms a vital element in all religious consciousness apart from this general objectivity of dialectic we find traces of its presence in each of the particular provinces and phases of the natural and spiritual world take as an illusion the motion of the heavenly bodies at this moment the planet stands in this spot but implicitly it is the possibility of being in another spot and that possibility of being otherwise the planet brings into existence by moving similarly the physical elements prove to be dialectical the process of the meteorological action is the exhibition of their dialectic it is the same dynamic that lies at the root of every other natural process and as it were forces nature out of itself 
to illustrate the presence of dialectic in the spiritual world especially in the provinces of law and morality we have only to recollect how general experience shows us the extreme of one state or another suddenly shifting into its opposite a dialectic which is recognised in many ways in common proverbs thus summa jus summa injuria which means that to drive an abstract right to its extremity is to do a wrong in political life as every one knows extreme anarchy and extreme despotism naturally lead to one another the perception of dialectic in the province of individual ethics is seen in well-known adages pride comes before a fall too much wit outwits itself even feeling bodily as well as mental has its dialectic every one knows how the extremes of pain and pleasure pass into each other the heart overflowing with joy seeks relief in tears and the deepest melancholy will at times betray its presence by a smile scepticism should not be looked upon merely as a doctrine of doubt it would be more correct to say that the sceptic has no doubt of his point which is the nothingness of all finite existence he who only doubts still clings to the hope that his doubt may be resolved or that one or other of the definite views between which he always wavers will turn out solid and true scepticism properly so called is a very different thing it is complete hopelessness about all which understanding counts stable the feeble to which it gives birth is one of unbroken calmness and inward repose such at least is the noble scepticism of antiquity especially as exhibited in the writings of sextus empiricus when in the later times of rome it had been systematised as complement to the dogmatic systems of stoic and epicurean of far other stamp and to be strictly distinguished from it is the modern scepticism already mentioned which partly preceded the critical philosophy and partly sprung out of it that later scepticism consisted solely in denying the truth and certitude of the supersensible and in pointing to the fact of sense and immediate sensation as what we have to keep to even to this day scepticism is often spoken of as the irresistible enemy of all positive knowledge and hence of philosophy in so far as philosophy is concerned with positive knowledge but in the these statements there is a misconception it is only the finite thought of abstract understanding which has to fear scepticism because unable to withstand it philosophy includes the sceptical principle as subordinate function of its own in the shape of dialectic in contradistinction to mere scepticism however philosophy does not remain content with the purely negative result of dialectic the sceptic mistakes the true value of his result when he supposes it to be no more than a negation pure and simple for the negative which emerges as the result of dialectic is because a result at the same time the positive it contains what it results from absorbed into itself and made part of its own nature thus conceived however the dialectical stage has the features characterising the third grade of logical truth the speculative stage or stage of positive reason apprehends the unity of terms propositions in their opposition the affirmative which is involved in their disintegration and in their transition one the result of dialectic is positive because it has a definite content or because its result is not empty and abstract nothing but the negation of certain specific propositions which are contained in the result for the very reason that it is a resultant and not an immediate nothing it follows from this that the reasonable result though it be only a thought and abstract is still concrete being and not plain formal unity a unity of distinct propositions bare abstractions or formal thoughts are therefore no business of philosophy which has to deal only with concrete thoughts the logic of mere understanding is involved in speculative logic and can at will be elicited from it by the process of omitting the dialectical and reasonable element when that is done it becomes what the common logic is a descriptive collection of sundry thought forms and rules which finite though they are are taken by something infinite if we consider only what it contains and not how it contains it the true reason world so far from being the exclusive property of philosophy is the right of every human being on whatever grade of culture or mental growth he may stand which would justify man's ancient title of rational being the general mode by which experience first makes us aware of the reasonable order of things is by accepted and unreasoned belief and the character of the rational as already noted is to be unconditioned and thus to be self-contained self-determining in this sense man above all things becomes aware of the reasonable order when he knows of god he knows him to be the completely self-determined similarly the consciousness a citizen has of his country and its laws is a perception of the reason world 
so long as he looks up to them as unconditioned and likewise universal powers to which he must subject his individual will and in the same sense the knowledge and will of the child is rational when he knows his parents will and wills it now to turn these rational of course positively rational realities into speculative principles the only thing needed is that they be thought the expression speculation in common life is often used with a very vague and at the same time secondary sense as when we speak of a matrimonial or commercial speculation by this we only mean two things first that what is immediately at hand has to be passed and left behind and secondly that the subject matter of such speculations though in the first place only subjective must not remain so but be realised or translated into objectivity what was some time ago remarked respecting the idea may be applied to this common usage of the term speculation and we may add that people who rank themselves amongst the educated expressly speak of speculation even as if it were something purely subjective and certain theory of some conditions and circumstances of nature or mind may be say these people very fine and correct as a matter of speculation but it contradicts experience and nothing of the sort is admissible in reality to this the answer is that the speculative is in true signification neither preliminarily nor even definitively something merely subjective that on the contrary it expressly rises above such oppositions as that between subjective and objective which the understanding cannot get over and absorbing them into itself evinces its own concrete and all-embracing nature a one-sided proposition therefore can never even give expression to a speculative truth if we say for example that the absolute is the unity of subjective and objective we are undoubtedly in the right but so far one-sided as we enumerate the unity only and lay assent upon it forgetting that in reality the subjective and objective are not merely identical but also distinct speculative truth it may also be noted means very much the same as what in special connection with religious experience and doctrines used to be called mysticism the term mysticism is at present used as a rule to designate what is mysterious and incomprehensible and in proportion as their general culture and way of thinking vary the epithet is applied by one class to denote the real and the true by another to name everything connected with the superstition and deception on which we first of all remark there is a mystery in the mystical only however for the understanding which is ruled by the principle of abstract identity whereas the mystical as synonymous with the speculative is the concrete unity of these propositions which understanding only accepts in their separation and opposition if those who recognise mysticism as the highest truth are content to leave it in its original utter mystery their conduct only proves that for them too as well as their antagonists thinking means abstract identification and that in their opinion therefore truth can only be won by renouncing thought or is frequently expressed by leading the reason captive but as we have seen abstract thinking of understanding is so far from being either ultimate or stable that it shows a perceptual tendency to work its own dissolution and swing round into its opposite reasonableness on the contrary just consists in embracing within itself these opposites as unsubstantial elements thus the reason world may be equally styled mystical not however because thought cannot both reach and comprehend it but merely because it lies beyond the compass of understanding logic is subdivided into three parts one the doctrine of being two the doctrine of essence three the doctrine of notion and idea that is into the theory of thought one in its immediacy the notion implicit and in germ two in its reflection and mediation the being for self and show of the notion three its return into itself and its developed abiding by itself the notion in and for itself the division of the logic now given as well as the whole of the previous discussion on the nature of thought is anticipatory and the justification or proof of it can only result from the detailed treatment of thought itself for in philosophy to prove means to show how the subject by and from itself makes itself what it is the relation in which these three leading grades of thought or of the logical idea stand to each other must be conceived as follows truth comes only with the notion or more precisely the notion is the truth of being in essence both of which when separately maintained in their isolation cannot but be untrue the former because it is exclusively immediate and the latter because it is exclusively immediate why then it may be asked begin with the false and not at once with the true to which we answer that truth to deserve the name must authenticate its own truth which authentication here within the sphere of logic is given when the notion demonstrates itself to be what is mediated by and with itself and thus at the same time to be truly immediate this relation between three stages of logical idea appear in a real and concrete shape thus god who is the truth is known by us in his truth that is as absolute spirit only in so far as we at the same time 
recognise that the world which he created nature and the finite spirit are in their difference from god untrue end of chapter six recording by ryan smallwood